Question number 10, Stuart Nash. Thank you to the Minister of Finance. By how many percent has the GDP per capita gap between Australia and New Zealand widened since the National Government took office? The Honourable Bill English. Mr Speaker, in September 2008, Australian GDP per capita was 37 per cent higher than in New Zealand. In June 2011, the gap was still 37 per cent. So it hasn't widened. In fact, if you adjust the figures to reflect changes in purchasing power parity, as, as, the, OE, as the OECD does, there's been a narrowing of the gap over that time from 40 per cent to 36 per cent. Thank goodness this government is starting to turn things around after nine years of economic mismanagement under the Labor Party. Stuart Nash. To the Minister, is he aware that the $37 billion he has borrowed in less than three years is the fastest run-up in government debt in percentage terms since the New Zealand wars, and the financing costs of the mountain of debt he has built up is now $10 million a day with no growth to show for it? And insofar as the yes, primary question about GDP per capita, I guess if the Minister has the information to answer that question, yeah. the Honourable Bill English. Mr Speaker, I am aware that it is uh, one of the more rapid uh, debt build-ups and I'm very pleased we didn't take any of the advice of the Labor Party to borrow a whole lot more money and they need to understand that policy that is going to continue to increase borrowing order, is bad order, for debt. A point of order has been called. I mean, do I need... The, the Minister was talking about Labor policy. Order. That's a simple question. No, order. Gave an order. Answer, order. Right. order and there will be silence. The dilemma I have, the primary question asked by how many percent is the GDP per capita gap uh, between Australia and New Zealand widened since this government took office? Now, the Minister gave uh, some, some comprehensive information in answering that question. The supplementary the member then asked was about borrowing or debt levels, which is significantly away from the primary question. And allowing the, the, the Minister of Finance to answer it, I, it's very difficult for me then to pull him back to a supplementary that really was well away from the primary question. Just because a question is asked about an economic issue doesn't mean any economic issue is available to be uh, for supplementary questions. The supplementaries should relate to GDP issues and, and the relationship between Australia and New Zealand. And that's why I'm loath to pull up the Minister of Finance because his answer may not have been quite what the member wanted it. I can be much more stringent on answers when questions are more disciplined and... Re and and, uh, well, the order, the, there's been interjection while well, the Speaker's been on his feet that the first question was. And I'll, I'll deal with it, because the answer was actually a, a very comprehensive answer to the question. And I heard all the interjections come in when the Minister introduced the issue of purchase, purchasing power parity. He's perfectly entitled to do that, because that's the way the OECD looks at, at uh, GDP uh, per capita relationships. And, and so there was nothing wrong with the answer. The Minister gave two sets of information that was very comprehensive. Uh, the point of order, the Honourable David Cunliffe. Mr Speaker, you've previously ruled it out of order for Ministers opposite to uh, discuss Labour Party policy or attribute matters to the Labour Party in answer to questions about the Government's performance or in particular about forward-looking questions uh, where data is available that could answer them. Mr Speaker, there have been several occasions today where straight, factual, primary questions have been asked and the response from Ministers has been to talk about Labour Party policy, which leaves us in a dilemma. Order. Firstly, Order. the characterisation has been sufficient. Order. I've heard sufficient from the Member. Look, it doesn't need me to uh, explain to the Member why he's just got to think more clearly about the questions being asked. But if the Member asks questions, the Member's the Finance spokesperson, the Opposition. If he asks questions to do with debt, there's no way I can stop a minister. Debt doesn't just happen overnight. There's invariably, and I shouldn't be giving a lecture to the finance spokesperson, debt has a history associated with it. And I can't stop a minister from reporting on that history. But I, I, sh I promise the member, where, I, where, where he asks a straight question that, that uh, 
uh, that is you know, clearly related to the primary question, I'll try to pin ministers down for him. I, and I, I regret if I've given the member the impression that I'm not doing that because I, I feel it is my responsibility to do that. So I apologize if he feels that I haven't done that, but I do ask that he just think about the questions. And where questions relate to debt, it's very difficult to, to uh, stop a minister going back over the years where debt accumulates. Uh, Stuart Nash. Uh, to the question. Minister of Finance. Has he considered resigning due to his failure to keep his promise to close the gap with Australia, his failure to keep his budget promises on growth, or for being the first finance minister in 13 years to lead New Zealand order. to a credit downgrade? Order. Point of order, the Honourable Trim Miller. I, I wasn't going to interrupt, sir, but the, the suggestion of the Prime Minister that you don't need to resign, Mr Speaker, I think is a bit outrageous on the second to last day. He's been here for a while. No, order. I think he shouldn't speak to you that order. way. Now, the member knows that I accept at the moment the standing orders don't prevent uh, members from uh, raising points of order about the use of the word you, but we are heading to a situation where that should be a matter for the Speaker to determine, so it can't be used to interrupt uh, either questioners or... But I would just remind the, the member is right, and I would remind the Prime Minister that every time he refers... To you, he is referring to the Speaker, and, and I hope the Speaker is not uh, responsible for some of the things that the Prime Minister might have uh, just been alleging uh, or about to do what the Prime Minister might have been suggesting. Uh, Stuart Nash, could he start his question again, please? Thank you very much. To the Minister of Finance, has he considered resigning due to his failure to keep his promise to close the gap with Australia, his failure to keep his budget promises on growth? or for being the first finance minister in 13 years to lead New Zealand into a credit downgrade. The Honourable Bill English. Mr Speaker, no. No. And that member may be saved the trouble of resigning because despite what he thought was a secure place on the Labour list, he may well not be here in the next parliament. Question number 11. I beg your pardon. Supplementary question. Aaron Gilmore. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Supplementary question to the Minister. How has the GDP per capita gap between Australia and New Zealand changed over a longer term period? The Honourable Bill English. Well, Mr Speaker, in, in September... What did you say? Mr. Speaker, Order. in September 1999... Order. Order. I'd just ask the House please to come back to order. I do want to hear the answer. The Honourable Bill English. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's because it's an interesting answer. In September 1999, Australian GDP per capita was 18.18% higher than New Zealand. By 2008, that gap had blown out to 37%. Again, if you adjust the figures in the way the OECD does to reflect changes in purchasing power parity, there is still clear evidence of a blowout from 30% in 1999 to 40% in 2008. That shows just as just one more measure of how far New Zealand's economy went backwards under the stewardship of the Labor Party. Question number 11, Nikki Kaye. 